This is evident in the use of thin, multiple washes of pigment to render the light and shadows of the diaphanous drapery and thereby form of the standing female figure on the first stele I showed. In raking light, the image that you see it right, one can make out the thick, almost impostor-like effect created by these layerings of pigments. A similar controlled and deliberate approach is evident in the use of blue and red in this detail of the seated male figure from the same painting. His hair did not originally appear blue. Rather, this is a now exposed underpaint used to create rich, complex, deep, dark tones in the blackish, brownish hair. And if you look on the perimeter of the head, you can make out individual locks of this original hair. This is a technique that we have evidence for in contemporary Athenian white ground pottery, um, but what we're seeing in the panel is a much more sophisticated um, and complex use of, of colors and layerings of pigments. You'll also note the very localized, fine pointed um, use of the distinctive red pigment, a vermilion pigment, on the nose, lips, ears, and cheeks of the figure. And also note how the loss that we have in the hair is continued, perhaps, to the area of the beard, which being a thinner, um, thinner area of hair did not need the same sort of blue underpaint that was used on the head itself. One particularly interesting finding of the recent research on the Metropolitan Steely is the identification of a new, heretofore unknown pigment in the palette of classical Greece. This is the light yellow pigment that we have on the background of the, the stele and used in combination with lead white in the tunic of the two figures on the, the stele as pointed out. This light yellow pigment is a lead arsenate mineral known as mimetite. Interestingly, this pigment is found neither in the earlier Egyptian tradition of painting nor in the later Greco-Roman tradition. If one scans the Mediterranean basin, this pigment is also found in concentration, really in only one place, the silver mines at Lavrion near Athens. These mines were, of course, the, the great financial uh, windfall of the Athenians in the period right before the Persian invasions. And the mines at Lavrion are fascinating to see um, and extensive. And they reached their peak of their production in the 5th and 4th centuries BC. And we have evidence already by the late 4th and 3rd centuries that the mining activity at Lavrion was largely one of recycling the earlier slags. So we have a very narrow window, if you will, of when um, Lavrion was being mined to, the, to its greatest extent. The image you see at left is one of these enormous ancient mines. And at right, you see mimetite as it would have been seen in antiquity. Here, you're looking at an area of the galena ore, the silver-containing ore, and the mimetite forms a thin yellow crust that someone who would be interested in such matters could have easily have scraped off. This is a relatively thin crust that was, in, that was found recently, but if you look at other areas, you have areas where the, these yellow crusts actually be quite thick. So this was not a, um, this was a relatively um, abundant pigment at Lavrion. We tend to understand the palette of classical Greece in reference to the ancient authors that describe the ancient pigments, and they being Pliny and Vitruvius. But the extensive mines at Lavrion yield a rainbow of colorful minerals in both their ancient ores and in the remaining ancient slags. And I show you this map of Lavrion to just give you a sense of the extent of the mining activity 
and a view at right of the Temple of Poseidon at Sunion, um, which is a, a, a common tourist destination and a good archaeological site that's at the southern tip of this area, should any of you have been to the temple there. Future analysis, I would propose, may reveal that the, the really colorful range of minerals from Livrion offer a great, offer great potential for contextualizing and understanding our understanding of classical Greek painting, especially in the fifth and fourth centuries. Interestingly, the tradition of Greek painting came to be centered in Athens at this period. And if you think of Plato and contemporaries, there's a great discussion about the range of different colors used and the mimetic qualities. And for those of you who are perhaps interested, one can easily search online at um, Mindat and a number of other sites, really a wealth of minerals that are found at Lavernon. That is to say that there's a large secondary non-academic literature, non-academic literature out there that really um, is a, even including guides to finding minerals at Lavrion um, that, that, is of, that is of use in this sort of question. The human eye, of course, remains our most valuable tool to appreciate and understand and understand works of art. However, with the aid of science and new forms of technology, we can look beyond and acquire new appreciation and insights into our understanding of classical art. This new information often asks that we look upon the familiar, both our aesthetic assumptions and current understanding, in new ways. And I think this may be one of the most important benefits of incorporating scientific research into the study of works of art. Today, I've tried to illustrate that the evidence of ancient polychromy, both on sculpture and painting, rewards the efforts of such investigation. And it is through such research that we are increasingly beginning to glimpse a new colorful world of classical antiquity, quite different from that which we are familiar with. Thank you.